which is, this doesn't move very much, does it? Okay. All right. So Music Ophelia, which is the book that's there on the left, written by Dr. Oliver Sacks. Has anyone seen the movie Awakenings with uh, Robin Williams? He plays Oliver Sacks. Yeah. So Oliver Sacks is a very famous British neurologist who wrote the book Awakenings, and he wrote many books. Has anyone read um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat? Also a very famous book. Um, he, had a, he had a patient who had some neurological disorder. I don't remember which one it was. And he thought his wife was a hat. He had trouble recognizing wh who was his wife and what was a hat. And Dr. Sachs has written about all sorts of topics, hallucinations, migraines, uh, face blindness. And unfortunately, last week he wrote uh, an article in the New York in the New York Times that he's dying he's dying from terminal cancer, and I I was heartbroken when I found out because this is a man who has changed the last eight ha eight and a half years of my life. My book, Language as Music, was based on what I had read in his book, Musicophilia. He wanted to understand why was it that his stroke patients who had lost the ability to speak were moved by music. They could sing, they could dance, they could play the piano, but they couldn't speak. And what he realized in his research was that music activates more parts of our brain than language does. So if there's a song that you remember from your childhood, you are more likely to recall the words of the song, you can sing the song, than if you were to, if you were to be asked, can you say the words of the song? Because when words are tied to music in the brain, they stick. Whereas words that your professor told you yesterday in class might not stick today. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if that's true, because some of your professors are here, right? You don't want to embarrass yourself in front of them. The same thing. You don't remember what you bought at the grocery store, but you can remember a nursery rhyme from when you were a child. And that's because of the effect of music on the brain. And if you think about religious groups, gospel music, they use music for people to remember hymns, for people to remember things in, in church. Many times people who were singing in churches or other religious or other religious groups were illiterate. The way they remembered was through music. So I realized that the way I was listening to language was that I was listening to language as though, it, as though they were songs. So I heard Spanish from the age of five living in California, but I didn't start learning Spanish until I was like 15 or 16 years old. And when I started speaking Spanish, did I have an American accent? No. I was learning with a Mexican accent because that was the predominant Spanish that I heard in California since I was a child. And it was because all of those years of hearing Mexican Spanish in California, it just stuck in my head like a song. And then when I had to learn the words of the song, I already had the song in my head. I just had to uh, go back to it. And not only was I learning language, not only was I listening to language as, song, as music, but I was listening to songs in the language that I was learning. So I heard lots of Spanish music living in California way before I started learning Spanish. So when it came time to learn grammar and vocabulary, when I was learning something and my teacher was you know, writing something on the, on the board, I already had the language somewhere in my head. I just had to access it. So it was like, for example, if you join a choir and you're going to learn, let's say, whatever, it's a Beatles choir, and you're just going to learn Beatles music, and you've never read the lyrics to a Beatles song before, you've never played music, but you've been listening to Beatles your whole life. When it comes to singing the song and you have the lyrics in front of you, it doesn't take you that much work because you've heard it all your life. That, that's kind of like the analogy. So when I read this book, I, I, this light well went off in my head, and I said, this is why... I'm able to process language. And I decided to write a book about it. Um, here's more information. It's probably hard to see on the screen. But there's another book called This Is Your Brain on Music. And the, the, um, the researcher, who's also a musician, shows different parts of the brain that are, that are affected. So I also read that book. So I decided to write my book about how to use music to learn language because what I noticed from being a student of language and also teaching uh, language in the classroom is that shoving a book in front of somebody's face and telling them learn these grammar rules, tomorrow uh, regurgitate these vocabulary words on a vocabulary test, and oh yeah, let's do a conjugation table doesn't work for most people. 
I did learn language that way, but I'm an, I'm an exception. Most of the time, and unfortunately I find this worldwide because I've given presentations in various countries, people get bored in language classrooms because language is presented to them in a stale book. And that's not the way we learn language as children. When we learn language as kids, we hear our, ma ma our native tongue for a year before we start speaking. Our brains have to get used to the sound of the language. So when we come into a, a language classroom and on the first day, we're told, okay, everybody, let's repeat, bienvenido, welcome. And everyone says, bienvenido. And then you have to say something in Spanish, for example, yo me llamo. So you say, yo me llamo. The next day, you're most likely not going to remember it because it, these sounds are all new to you. Oh, but then a week later, you already have a test on the stuff that you had to learn on the first day. That's not a natural way to learn language. And I realize that the way to make people more multilingual and the way to make language learning effective was to use methodologies that were fun and would stick in the, in the brain. And for me, it was music. So you can even learn complex grammatical structures in a song because you remember the structure because you've remembered the verses. So one of the examples I give, okay, first of all, let me ask, how many people here have studied Spanish? Okay, several of you have studied Spanish. Okay, so you know there's this thing called the subjunctive in Spanish, which is barely exists in English. You use the subjunctive when there's something that's in doubt. So, if you, for example, we have it in English, but most people don't realize it exists. When you say, "If I were you, I would do this," you don't say, "If I was you," you say, "If I were you." That's one of the very, very few uses of the subjunctive in English. Or if you say, "God save the queen." That's also the subjunctive or the imperative. So the subjunctive case in Spanish exists. Most English speakers have hor a horrible time learning it and make mistakes with it. And I remembered the song. Do you guys know the song Bésame Mucho? Bésame, bésame mucho, como si fuera esta noche la última vez. So kiss me, kiss me a lot, kiss me a lot, as though tonight were the last night. Again, the subjunctive, as though tonight were. Because I don't know, maybe I won't see you tomorrow, maybe I won't see you in a week, so kiss me now, a lot, because, you know, it's maybe the last time. So when the, my Spanish teacher was writing on the wall the, con the conjugation for the subjunctive, I was like, oh, I remember this from the song Besme Mucho, and it stuck in my head. So I realized, okay, we have to figure out how classrooms can use songs to teach language. And the other thing that helps, that really helps with language learning is it helps you learn the sounds of the language. So when I said that when I started learning Spanish when I was 15 or 16, I didn't speak with an American accent, it was because I was used to the sounds of Spanish. There was a French ear doctor called Dr. Alfred Tomatis, and he wanted to understand why people have accents in a language. And he came, what he realized was that people don't hear the sounds correctly. So if it's for your first time learning Spanish and you've never heard R, the rolled R, you're physically unable to make that sound because you've never heard it before. So your brain has to get used to the sounds of the language in order for your brain to activate the muscles in your mouth and your throat to create those sounds. So he came up with a whole theory called Suggestopedia where he used different classical music, especially Mozart's music, because he said that mo certain, a certain piece of Mozart music had the highest range of frequency, from low frequency to high frequency, ah, sounds for the brain to be able to get used to the range of frequencies. And that's why it's so important for people to listen to music, even if it's in the background, or to listen to music in a language like I was listening to music in Spanish for so many years, because my brain unconsciously was getting used to the sounds of Spanish. So when it came to speaking the language, boom, it came out. Now you might think, okay, well, well then why is it that so many people who live on the border in the United States between the United States and Mexico are not speaking fluent Spanish? And it's because, first of all, many of them don't care. And that's because of the rate of ignorance in, in the United States around why it's important to be multilingual. But it's because a lot of them don't even bother, they're not actually paying attention when they're hearing the Spanish. It's just like this white noise in the background. But it's important for, for them to listen, and that's what I'm talking about in my presentations, it's about listening to Spanish 
or whatever the language happens to be in order to, to learn the language. Now I have to say the same is true when you go to the Mexican border on the Mexican side and you wonder why, isn't it, why aren't more people speaking English because they have so much access to listening. It's because also of a lack of desire and, and that's a problem with our educational system. What helps you with music when you're learning a language is you're learning the rhythm of the language. And if you hear, for example, I'm going to use Spanish as an example again, English speakers, when they're speaking in Spanish, oftentimes speak with the monotony of English. English is quite flat compared to the ups and downs of Spanish. So instead of saying, um, yo quiero un taco, I want a taco, yo quiero un taco, like lengthening the vowels when they don't need to be lengthening and just speaking like this. When you get used to the sounds of the language, it's literally like you're dancing the language. So when I have the example of a choir, you know a choir, if they're singing music, choral music, they're not going to be dancing with like drum beats, like in an African drum beat. What happens when you don't learn the music of the language that you're learning, that you're speaking, is that you're literally using the music of your own language. The monotony of English compared to the, 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 the rhythm of Spanish. So, unfortunately, this got cut off, but when I talk about practical tips for learning languages, I talk about listening. So if you hear a song in another language, at the beginning, you have to just find music that you like. And many times, music t uh, language teachers will play music that they liked from like 40 years ago, which may not be of interest to modern audiences. And I find this across the board that Many times language teachers will not use contemporary music that students are listening to. So if, if students are listening to Shakira, then language teachers should find appropriate, and I say appropriate because it's very important, appropriate Shakira songs to be playing in the classroom for students to be learning Spanish. Now, of course, not all contemporary music is something that you would ever want in a classroom. You would never teach English through a lot of rap music or hip-hop music because the language is incorrect, there's a lot of slang, semi-pornographic, that's not the way you would want somebody to learn a language. So you have to be careful about the choice. But what's important is, as a language student, is to find music that you like and just get used to it. Don't even think about it. Get used to it, singing, so on and so forth. And then write down the lyrics as you're listening to it to see if like, you can actually recognize the words. And then compare the lyrics to the real, real lyrics, which you can find on the internet and see how much you wrote, you understood compared to what the, what the real lyrics are. And imagine what the story is in your head. So for example, if it's New York, New York, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra's talking about someone from a small town going to a big city and seeing people walking at night, you imagine the story in your head. Because language is not just spoken, it's a multi-sensory experience. So you have to use your visual imagination to Imagine what you're hearing and what you're reading into something that you can picture. Because some people are actually visual learners. And when, there's, when they have a book in front of their face with uh, conjugation tables and vocabulary lists, they don't learn. Because it's not activating the visual uh, part of their brain, which is what they actually are responding to. So when you're learning a language, you have to find other ways to keep it going. Drawing pictures. Some people draw, and that's how they remember things. And listening to the music in your head. So even as you're walking to school, you're taking the bus, play the music in your head. Because what happens if you're listening to, for example, Adele in your head, an Adele song? Who is singing? Is it Adele or you? Anyone? Who's singing in your head? Like if you remember your favorite singer, if it's John Coltrane, whoever, it's the singer, right? It's not you. So if you're listening to music in Japanese in your head, you're still activating the parts of your brain that are responsible for long-term memory. And that's, they're all, that's very important for you to imagine things. Like, you know, athletes, they imagine themselves uh, scoring in a game because the visualization parts of their brain then activate what, they're in, what they end up doing. Singing. Sing in the shower if you don't want to sing in front of other people. Have a karaoke contest with your friends. You sing and you make it fun. Because th when you kind of let your guard down and you're singing and you're having fun, your brain is more likely to absorb information. Because when your brain is like pressed like this, like, oh, I have a test, you don't retain that much information. When you're relaxed, you retain a lot more. 
So, of course, you can listen to uh, radio. Like, I listened to radio in Portuguese for several years, and I didn't think I could speak Portuguese. And then, lo and behold, one day I was forced to speak Portuguese, and words came out of my mouth that I didn't even know that I knew. That was because of all the years of listening to, the, listening to radio in Portuguese. You can listen to it in the background, because as I said before, your brain has to get used to the sounds of the language. So even if you have something in the background, when you're driving, you're washing the dishes, your brain is still processing those sounds. Watching television programs, uh, one of the best ways, I think, is actually through watching the news, because let's say they're talking about ISIS in Japanese, and you've already watched what's going on about ISIS in English. When you watch it in Japanese, or whatever lang the language is, it's just going to stick in your head. Because if they're talking about murder, or let's say there's a fire, and they say the word fire five times in Japanese, and they show a picture of a fire, and you didn't know the word for fire before, eventually you're going to figure out that whatever the word in Japanese is for fire is what you're hearing. And you're making, you're creating that visual link to what you're hearing. Uh, obviously, you can get on the internet, well, now you it's hard to get Al Jazeera, but you, know, you can get all sorts of other programs on the internet. Films. Don't watch films dubbed in English. Now, in other countries, a lot of the films are dubbed. So, for example, if you hear people from Scandinavia speak in English, fantastic English. Sometimes they can even pass as Native American speakers. Now, when you go to Germany, Italy, Spain, and France, much thicker accents. Why? When they get programming in English on TV or the movies, it's all dubbed in their language. So they're not even hearing Native speakers. So you need to watch things in their Native. Uh, and I have one minute. So... Obviously, with movies, at some point, you need to close your eyes and just hear what people are saying and then rewind and watch the scene again and see if what you heard actually corresponds to what was going on. And then you have to speak. Even if you think you speak like Tarzan. Oh, I have a little bit more time? I do? Okay, good, because I have a video I wanted to show. Okay. So... Um, it's really important to speak even if you're afraid that you're going to make mistakes. So a lot of times people are, they say, oh, I can understand what people are saying, I can read, I can write, but I'm so afraid of speaking because I'm going to make a fool of myself. Well, give it up. Make a fool of yourself. Because if you don't make a fool of yourself, you're never going to learn. So I say, if, even if you speak like Tarzan, you know, you're really like, I Apple now, if you go to the store, the person's going to understand that you want to buy an apple now. Even though you sound like you're a Neanderthal, you're still going to get the apple as long as you can pay for it, right? Who cares? And I'll give you an example. So, yeah, I speak eight languages. Three years ago, or three, two and a half years ago, I was in Bosnia filming a movie that I'm going to talk about tomorrow about this language called Judeo-Spanish. And I hadn't been in Bosnia for, I don't know, eight years. And I used to live there, and I, used to, and I did speak the language. But I hadn't used it in a long time, and I was rusty. And we found out that we needed a film permit to film at the train station because um, one of my colleagues and the film guy went out to the train station and got kicked out because they didn't have a film permit. Out of everybody on the team, I was the only person that could speak the local language. So I had to call the train authority and figure out how to get a film permit. Had I ever asked for a film permit before in Bosnia or Serbo Croatia? No. Did I know how to say it? No. Did I get the permit? Yes. I didn't. The person listening to me on the phone understood what I had to say, even though I was making mistakes. I Sometimes I was speaking in broken Bosnian, but they got it. They understood that I needed a permit to film at the train station, what the purpose I had, and I got it. They sent it to me by email. Did I care that I sounded sometimes like an idiot? No, because I had a goal. And... That's something that people, especially adults, have a lot of trouble with. If you're a kid and you make a mistake, well, no, no, no one really cares, right? Because you're a kid and you're going to make mistakes in your own language. But adults fear that other people are going to think that they're stupid. That's why it's really important to use music. So if you're having a karaoke contest with your friends or in a classroom, everyone else is going to look silly too. Put on a funny hat. Put on a costume. So you don't even think that it's you. It's just this weird get up this Halloween costume that you have. If you're watching a movie with friends, you could act out one of the scenes. You could go on the internet, find the script for the movie, and act out one of the scenes in the language. And you just make it into a fun game. Because the sooner you stop taking yourself seriously, the quicker you are going to learn. 
So I'm going to show a video about, this is again from Dr. Oliver Sacks, about how music affects the brain. And this is um, about, oh sorry, it has subtitles in Spanish because I used it for another presentation. So if you don't mind the subtitles in Spanish, you'll be fine. So he's talking about the effect of, of music on the brain. So let's just hope this works. Oh no. Oh no, no, no. I'm sorry. I thought it was subtitled in Spanish. And turns out it was dubbed in Spanish, which is exactly what I told you we shouldn't do, right? Let me see if they switch to subtitles. <laughs> How many people would understand? A couple? Do you want me to play it in Spanish? And, and stop and explain? Or should I show you another? Yeah? Okay, all right. All right, cool. El cerebro sintoniza mucho con la música, incluso en personas de las llamadas poco musicales. Crecemos en un entorno en el que hay música por todas partes, ya sea música popular, sofisticada, jazz, clásica. Todos hemos crecido en un entorno musical. Y el cerebro es muy sensible a la música. La música está presente en todas las culturas. Y es importante cada cultura. Es importante para cada persona. Yo me volvería loco si no tuviera mi piano, si no pudiera tener música. La música también tiene un gran poder organizativo. A menudo en las canciones de los niños. En el Reino Unido, por ejemplo, aprendemos la canción One to Back on My Shoe. Y una serie de frases puede recordarse si se organizan con música. La gente recuerda toda la letra de una canción si va acompañada de la música. A menudo la gente con afasia, que han perdido el lenguaje, puede mantener el lenguaje si está con música. En la actualidad estoy escribiendo sobre personas que tienen alucinaciones musicales que de repente escuchan música con tal viveza que se creen que la radio o el que está tocando el piano está en el cuarto de al lado. Esto es diferente de imaginarse la música, porque ellos creen que la perciben. Tu primera experiencia terapéutica con la música fue en uh, ese libro maravilloso, Despertares. Esta fue la primera vez que percibiste la posibilidad de usar la música para reconstruir pacientes. Ahí se veía pacientes sin movimientos, congelados, que no podían moverse ni dar un paso, pero que en cambio podían bailar, o a pacientes que no podían emitir ni una sílaba, pero podían cantar. Yo sabía que la música parecía que de alguna manera sobrepasaba, al menos durante algunos minutos, el mal de Parkinson y los liberaba, les permitía el movimiento libre. A veces se podía ver incluso que solo cuando se imaginaban la música también podían funcionar de una manera similar, solo pensando en ella, y todo cambiaba, las ondas cerebrales cambiaban, había un cambio neurológico profundo con la música. Como has dicho esto, lo analicé primero con personas que padecían Parkinson y luego con otras que estaban como congeladas, como las personas de despertares. So, I, I'll just sum up the, the video. He was talking in about awakenings and also about people with Parkinson's, that when they heard music, parts, they, they, he did studies on them, that parts of their brain woke up. That even people with aphasia who couldn't speak were activated through music. He talked about people with musical hallucinations really thought that there was someone playing piano next door, but it was all in their head. There's a wonderful video, and you can find it on YouTube. It was on PBS like four years ago, where Dr. Oliver Sacks, he's a huge fan of Bach, 
and they did a study where they put him in an fMRI. An fMRI is when they study the what's going on in the brain. They put him in an fMRI machine at Columbia University to test his brain when he was listening to Bach and when he was imagining Bach in his head. And when he was imagining Bach music in his head, more parts of his brain were lit up. So this goes to show when I talked about listening to Adele or whatever the music is in your head, is that more parts of your brain are lit up. So literally you could be at the grocery store in line and helping yourself do your Spanish homework, or whatever homework it is, because you're remembering these, these songs. And unfortunately, in classrooms, a lot of times music is thought of as only for preschoolers, only for kindergartners. I live uh, near Monterey in California, where we have the Defense Language Institute, where people from the military go to learn languages. They use Sesame Street in Arabic to help American students who are going to go to Iraq or to any of their bases in Bahrain or in Qatar to learn Arabic. So if you have G.I. Joe out there watching Sesame Street in Arabic, then there's no reason why other students couldn't be using Sesame Street in Arabic or in you know, whatever language it is. And it's important for us to ask our instructors to use music. And many times they don't know how to use music. Well, you know, you can use music to teach chemistry. When I was in school, we didn't have a song for the periodic table of elements. It would have helped because I hated chemistry. And I, I was like, oh, this element thing, I have to memorize it. There's a physics uh, professor at Haverford University on the East Coast who plays the guitar in class to talk about f physics. So he has his students remember thing, the laws of physics to songs. And he uses like popular songs that people remember from different musicals. So you could literally use it for any class that you have a, that you have a test for. Let's say you're studying about Roman history and you love Lady Gaga. Well, take the important things that you need to remember about Rom Roman history and put them to a Lady Gaga song. I mean, you have to change the, I'm saying you have to change the lyrics and it sticks in your head. Now, the only thing is when you're taking your exam, you don't want to be singing, you know, at your top voice, some Lady Gaga song. And if your instructors don't, don't use music in the classroom, then you're going to have to do it yourself. Find creative ways to do it. So if any of you have questions, I can answer them later, of course. And I also have some books in case, you know, people want to buy the books. But remember, music activates more parts of your brain. So use it effectively to help you with any subject that you have to study. Thank you. speaking is also, and I try to use this in teaching, um, and I'm going to touch on this as I go through uh, this presentation, but um, just the use of stories as well to help in remembering. And um, and when you were speaking, I was uh, thinking back on some of the different songs and some of the different um, kind of theatrical presentations and songs in many of the countries where I've lived around the world, and that's definitely helped me to remember um, much about that culture, and I derive what um, a lot of what I do remember and know about these cultures from those experiences. Um, yes, yeah, so um, 
Okay, so I'm just going to kind of piece through here, first talking about music, then dance, and, and a little bit less on visual expression, but I'm hoping that maybe we can have more of a discussion on that, because I think that's an interesting component to this lecture as well. Um, and so just a little bit about me, obviously, um, it's actually more of my yoga bio that's in the handbook, but I'm happy that we got something in there. So um, this is actually uh, sort of predating um, my yoga days living in, in lots of different countries. So I studied at the University of Idaho, and um, I studied abroad four times, so I was somewhat of a poster child for the study abroad office and program. I ended up working for them also for several years, so um, that's likely the reason why. Um, the countries that I studied in were New Zealand, and then in Spain in the Basque country, studying Castellano. And then um, also I went to Thailand, and then um, to Western Africa, to Ghana. And then um, after I graduated, I uh, went and lived in India for a year. And then in the years um, since I lived in India, that first year, I've taken people on trips several times to India and also to South America and some different countries as well, primarily service and yoga-based trips. Um, so in those countries, um, I've definitely studied all the languages aside from English in New Zealand. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think I need to do a little bit more study of Hindi, whereas um, with my yoga teaching, um, it's really Pali and Sanskrit that I've studied more. And I definitely need to dive further into Hindi um, just with some of the NGO work that I'm going to be doing this coming year. Um, OK, so and then. Um, Yes, and then I've gone pretty pretty far into the yoga, but I'm trying to talk more so about these experiences and then also some of the different styles of meditation that I've studied around the world and that I also teach, many of them uh, making use of mantra and music and um, also in yoga there's japa yoga, which is kind of the yoga of sound, and um, then there's also the uh, swara yoga referring more to like chants and um, I guess it would be more of the song quality versus the repetition of a single word in mantra. Great. So, <laughs> yes. So in terms of some of the different meditation that I've studied around the world, I, I feel most inclined and I'm hoping to do more of the Sufi meditation, which is always tied to um, Sufi music. So in some Sufi meditation, you're also um, twirling or there's the twirling dervishes. But um, in the meditation I did, we were sitting, but there usually is live music. We had um, different recordings as well. But um, use of the drum, which seems sort of uh, contradictive to meditation in a lot of ways, but it's actually very helpful and rhythmic. And I think it does allow you to get into a different space in your mind and to um, kind of release your thoughts and to hopefully move into that higher mindset, which is uh, the purpose of meditation. So kind of coming back to some of the different countries that I've studied in, um, in Thailand I, I went to a lot of dance and I had um, some friends that did uh, the practice Thai dance and I found that very interesting. In Ghana I was able to participate a little bit more, so um, I took a drumming class and a dancing class and an ensemble class. An ensemble I think was uh, the most beautiful because it combined everything into one. So you would be dancing and singing and working together and exchange um, kind of uh, different turns at playing the balago and the different drums. So um, one thing that I thought also helps in um, not only dance in Thailand and with Asian dance, I think there tends to be these two categories. There's more classical dance and then there's more folk dance. Folk, da folk dance being more um, theatrical and oftentimes uh, involving the telling of a story. So when you look at the different classical dances that stem from India, there's um, there's a uh, Kathkali from the south, which um, many of you may recognize. It's where they, they'll paint their faces green and actually represent different characters from the Mahabharata or some of the classical um, texts from India. Basically, those classical texts are all stories, so very long stories, million word stories. <laughs> so very, very long. And uh, they'll break up those stories doing different dances. Um, Yes, and then, so in India and Thailand, you have kind of the same deviation or, or breakdown of dance in that regard. But in Ghana, I found um, the dance likely to be more folk related, and um, also there's more of a kind of community essence. So I'm really hoping that we'll, we'll get to do some West African dance at some point, maybe. 
I hope so. <laughs> I'm excited about that. Um, but oftentimes you'll be moving in a circle, moving together, and you'll kind of be doing the same movements going forward and back, like you're um, presenting somewhat of an offering as you're moving together. So you're going in a circle, then you'll break up, but usually you're doing not only the same movements, it's not as individualized as I would say dance is in the United States. It's more of a collective and um, kind of communal activity that everyone participates in. So even going to the different villages throughout Western Africa, I feel like we were always dancing and always um, singing, if we knew the songs. <laughs> and there were definitely drums present. And, um, and that's obviously much of what I remember from that experience. I feel like I remember more from that experience than I do from uh, years that I spent in other countries because of the involvement of the dance and the drumming. And um, I got to be a part of a few of the present, I guess, dance presentations. Um, and that was <coughs> a little intimidating because I tended to be the only Obruni or white person <laughs> there. And um, I try to dress up as best I could. But I had a blast, and it was, it was excellent. Um, OK, great. So and also with um, kind of studying all of those different languages, I do feel, um, you know, now I'm more, more kind of seeped in Sanskrit. But in terms of some of the songs and mantras and the significance and the meaning, I definitely remember those um, substantially more. So I'm going to try to break up the speaking just a little bit. And I know you sang a, a tiny bit. And I, I think, well, there's, um, I don't know. It's You're not an intimidating crowd, so I think I'll just go for it. <laughs> um, OK, so I was going to sing um, two different uh, West African songs. I believe they're both in Chui, but I, I could be wrong. One of them might be in Ewe. Um, and I do take music lessons, but it really doesn't mean that I'm um, good to any degree. But if you don't know the words, then hopefully you can't tell, actually, if, um, if I'm good at singing these songs or not. So um, the first song is um, it's actually a tragic story. It's about the loss of a daughter. Um, but it's, a, it's one of the most commonly known songs throughout Ghana, or when I went around and we sang it in, um, with our university group from this class, it seemed that everyone knew the song. And um, I think it's a good way to kind of convey and relate to each other, especially in troubling times, especially um, you know when losing children is a slightly more uh, prevalent part of life in some of these different places. Um, so it's called Ayele V, and it goes, Ayele V no kulo mito papa na yele V, eh mito papa na yele V, Ayele V no kulo mito papa na yele V. Eh, mi to papa na yelevi, a yelevi, a yelevi, a yelevi, a yelevi. Eh, mi to papa na yelevi. And then you just continue, and everyone joins in. And then you kind of split off, and you'll, um, uh, one group will sing one part of the song, or sometimes males and females will break into groups, and, and they'll do the a yelevi, a yelevi back to one another. And I believe a yelevi is the name of the daughter in the song. So it's a mother singing about the loss of her daughter. Um, and then the next song, I believe, is about um, war of some sort or two groups um, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, fighting amongst themselves. And um, it's talking about how the group is kind of coming over the mountain, I believe. And, um, and I think that's interesting because, again, these songs can be about things that are troubling but draw people together in terms of forming like a common humanity and um, forming more of a connection to one another. So the next song, um, I don't know if it has a separate name, but I'll just sing it for you. Gau via wet mapona, gau via wet mapona, mi demona gau via oe, gau oe, gau oe. Gau via wet mapona, gau via wet mapona, mi demona gau via oe, gau oe, gau oe. Great. This makes it more fun, right? <laughs> Okay, we agree on that. Perfect. You'll hopefully you'll remember something I said or that I sang a song. <laughs> yes, always accompanied by drawing. Uh huh. And typically, um, there might be a djembe drum. You might recognize that it has more of a range in sound. Um, but the balago drum is really typical in Ghana. And I really wish I would have brought my drum today. Actually, it was at the um, the Teton studio, so I, I would have brought it otherwise. Um, I had it carved with all these different symbols, and it's beautiful. Um, 
Okay, so um, in that song, when, when um, it sometimes again it'll break into different people doing the gawe um, gawe, and that's talking about um, kind of the other, I guess, the rival sort of coming over the hill. And so that I remember more than all, more than many other things that I've studied and learned around the world <laughs> that from that song. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and. Um, Hmm. I was debating doing a, a little bit of Indian dance, but I'm going to move into the um, mantras here. So the most common mantra um, in Sanskrit, and in the, and all these mantras stem from Pali, which is kind of the root um, or an even earlier form of the language um, Sanskrit. So this is the most commonly um, used mantra throughout all of India, and it's the Gayatri mantra. So um, Many daughters and um, possibly even sons, I believe, are named Gayatri after this mantra. Um, and the Gayatri mantra is the meaning or the significance is talking about um, wanting prosperity, wanting good things for everyone in the world. And it's a way of kind of drawing blessings to yourself by way of offering blessings to everyone around you. And the Gayatri mantra um, goes Om Bur Burvaswaha Tat Savachur Vayenyam. Bargo devasya dimahi dioyona prachodayat Om bur burvaswaha tat savachur vayenyam Bargo devasya dimahi dioyona prachodayat And you finish all mantras with Om shanti 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 means peace. So peace to all beings by saying peace three times. Okay, so that is a beautiful mantra. And um, also, it tends to be the first mantra that you would learn, aside from Om, which is, in Sanskrit, has a very large significance, meaning the primordial sound, or the sound of the creation of the universe. So Om starts all mantras um, and chants, and Om also has such a large meaning, it's really hard to encompass with just a few words, and I find that fascinating, and I do feel like, in watching many of your videos this morning, um, <laughs> When you said that you uh, have different personalities in different languages, I um, can attest to that as well, especially in different countries and with the different cultures, but I do believe that the language has a, is a major factor in that because of, um, especially when you're studying Sanskrit, um, and even reading Sufi poetry, when you're um, coming to some of these phrases and you're looking at um, the translation or the deciphering, even into English, you know, we'll use very large um, uh paragraphs, really, just to describe one short, you know, two or three words in, um, say, the translation of the Upanishads or the Vedas, um, etc., where um, much of yoga and Hinduism um, stems. So I, I just find that fascinating, and um, I'm looking forward to visiting China, which I have never visited this year, and um, I'm hoping that uh, my friend who's uh, a linguist and studying a language there can help me to discover a little bit more about Chinese in this regard because it's just so fascinating the way that certain words can encompass these grand ideas that we don't necessarily have in English. And we might have um, comparable vast ideas and concepts in English as well, but uh, they're very different. And in terms of the personalities when speaking languages, I do find that um, English tends to make me think more analytically. It keeps me more in my left brain, I would say. Um, other languages I, I feel a little bit more creative, um, philosophical, and definitely with studying Sanskrit, I feel um, a little bit more spiritually inclined. And I do think that is because of the language specifically, not just um, the endeavors that I'm undertaking. Um, Okay, so um, let's take a little break and I'll sing for you a final chant when we're done, <laughs> just to make it more fun. Okay, so in yoga, there is the, uh, the Nataraj, or, um, which, is, which is a depiction, and you'll see a lot of times a, a bronze um, sort of small statue with a big circle around it, and sometimes there's flames around the circle, sometimes not, and it's Lord Shiva doing the Nataraj or the dancer pose. So I thought I might just show you a dancer pose, because maybe you'll remember more. You see more, you hear more. Okay. So um, the dancer pose in yoga, you can obviously balance on either leg, and you'll hold on to the ankle. Sometimes you can hold on to the toe. And you'll take your arm out. And forward. And over. Okay. That was fun, right? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay. 
Um, great. So, yes, I want to come back to the telling of stories. And with the telling of stories, so uh, my background is a little bit more in international development. So work with NGOs, nonprofit organizations, internationally, and a lot of the work that they're doing on the ground around the world. And then in our course um, this semester, which I have two of my lovely students here today, um, we are covering more um, the uh, global health issues in relation to international development. And with some of those global health issues, um, we talk about how important it is to get the engagement and the participation and the involvement and um, kind of the entrust of all of the um, local people, the group of people, specifically in the region where you're working, and to have them actually help you find the solutions um, that you need for whatever issue you're working on. Say it's global health. Now, one of the... Um, there's two things I wanted to talk about. Um, the first being in terms of HIV and AIDS and um, some of the breakthrough uh, practices that did engage the local population that really made a large difference. And we've been talking about this in class. And that is very much the involvement of kind of the local theater. And um, there's usually uh, some, some dancing involved oftentimes. Um, a lot of the dances uh, involve the, um, I think it's a bunch of the willow sticks that are used for sweeping. And anyways, almost all of them I've seen involve that as one sort of tool that's always used. But um, in these kind of theatrical performances, there's a way to make the information more interesting so that it's not only conveyed and listened to, but remembered um, so much more. So kind of the acting out in a way that can be discreet about some of these personal issues, which are often avoided and not talked about um, in these different cultures especially in relation to your sexual activity, I think um, is really paramount. And that was sort of a turning point um, in getting the message across and getting the involvement not only of um, the females, of mothers, but of the whole community. So, um, so yes, I wanted to touch on that, that sort of theatrical involvement with song, with dance. Um, and then also, aside from HIV and AIDS, there's... Um, the different um, kind of local court system, or uh, sometimes you could call them a system of debate that's been used um, post-conflict in a lot of different countries as well. So if we're looking at, um, in Rwanda, this was, this was really paramount after the genocide there, um, the using of these local courts where um, people would gather, usually in a circle, and they would kind of debate these things, the, uh, some of the atrocities and usually offer sort of, um, um, there's definitely a bit of uh, public ostracizing, but then there's also kind of the healing and the coming back into the community of the people that have committed some of these atrocities. And that proved to be so much more healing and holistic for those communities than um, the involvement of the international criminal, criminal courts and some of the other options in that regard. So two instances where using um, theater and um, working together and um, using kind of music and dance oftentimes in a part of these theatrical performances proved paramount and sustainable and lasting beyond some of our own, um, beyond some of our sort of international development solutions that stem from our country. Okay? Oh, yay. <laughs> okay. So, um, let's see here. to some of those questions here at the end. Um, all right, so, <laughs> okay. So um, also just kind of coming back to the, um, the japa, the, the repetition of mantra, um, there's also something that happens, I think, in the brain, and that's why this, um, the uh, swara, the sound, is used so often in meditation, whether it's um, music that's being played around you, whether you're kind of actively swirling, whether you're sitting and listening to the music, um, whether you're repeating the mantra yourself, and usually it can be individually, but oftentimes it's in a group, and so the sound... Um, somewhat surrounds you and there's also a vibration to the sound so I think there's something to be said to uh, the vibration of sound as well in terms of singing in terms of mantra and what that does for your brain um, and in um, studies of different um, 
I guess you could call them ascetics or um, different yogis or swamis, um, teachers of yoga, doing some of these different mantras and chanting, um, their brain is affected similarly as it is in meditation. So you see um, kind of the center that revolves around the ego or the individual self sort of decrease in its in its activity. And then you see the centers that have to deal more with... Um, the world around you, more with other people, more with compassion, and more with seeing kind of that larger view light up. And um, that may not seem to be very important, but it's actually hugely important for kind of calming you down personally. And also, it's interesting because when meditation's done, um, while meditation's mostly done individually, you also kind of come to this broader perspective when you leave your meditation. And most meditations around the world do um, revolve around one idea being truth. Many of them are very different in their techniques and their practices, but truth is sort of universal as a principle and as a focus of meditation. But when you come out of meditation, you usually feel more connected to everyone around you. So that's, a, that's very interesting because you go inward to then feel more of this connection. And then obviously when you're in a room and you're hearing um, this sound and this vibration around you of the om, of the different chanting, of the repetition of a single mantra, a single word or two, or a longer chant, um, that vibration also, I think, begins to sort of balance you in your different energy centers, if you will, um, and also just... Um, yeah, balancing you, I think, in your brain activity as well, so that you're not so focused on that I and that to-do list, and it, it just brings you into a more kind of calm and communal state of mind. Um, and then when you're chanting with other people, you can see that the, that the resonance is um, quite large. Okay, so we have... We have a few minutes here to play right now. Mostly, I just want to ask you questions. But um, <laughs> I think what we'll do, because obviously anything that's more interactive um, tends to result in greater learning. So I'm going to have you all come away from the back of your seat, if you can, so that you can sit upright. Okay? And you're going to bring the soles of your feet flat on the ground and take your feet about hip-width apart. And you want to come forward so that your spine feels uh, very erect and you have a little bit of pressure on your feet. And then let's go ahead and take our hands um, down and just kind of clasp your knees for a second. Okay? So you're getting your, um, if you will, in yoga, your chakras or your energy centers from that Shashumna center, central energy channel in your body aligned so that your prana or qi, as is known in Chinese medicine, can flow evenly through all your different energy centers in your body. So let's have everyone just close their eyes. And then I'm going to have you take your first finger and your thumb together. So you're coming into Dhyana Mudra. This is your mudra for wisdom. And I want you to find a continuous and um, noticeable amount of pressure between your first finger and your thumb. And as you lengthen your spine, I want you to feel your shoulders roll back. But I don't want you to open just the front of your body. I want you to feel as equally open in the back of your body. So you're not leaning forward, you're not leaning back, but you feel straight. Your spine is straight. You feel aligned in this moment. Not too far into the future, not too far into the past. And then breathing into the base of your belly, also feeling that settling that happens when you allow the breath to reach into... Um, its fullest capacity, expanding in the lung capacity. You might even feel an expansion in the sides of the body, moving out toward the arms, and also in the back of the body, feeling the back ribs expanding and opening. Let's go ahead and take two full breaths along the spine. This is your thoracic breathing, breathing along the spine and as you breathe in, at first you're filling in the base of the spine, imagining a pooling of breath or a balloon expanding. And then the level or the air rising up through the spine, all the way up into the spreading of the shoulder blades until you feel as if you're full with breath up into the level of the neck. And then slowly exhaling, like you're pouring out a pitcher of water. So you're just feeling the air move from the top of your neck or your back slowly down until you push out the remaining air in your body from the pool in the base of your abdomen or the base of your spine. 
And let's just have everyone do another cycle or two of breath, making this cycle of breath as long, as steady, as smooth as possible, without any skips, without any jumps, taking in the same amount of air per second. And calming the transition between your inhale and exhale, between the exhale and the inhale. And now it's said in that natural kumbhaka or retention of breath that happens in between the inhale and exhale, so two times in the full cycle of your breath, after you inhale and after you exhale. In that natural kumbhaka or pause, even momentarily, um, you'll feel a stillness. And in that stillness, in that kumbhaka, is where it's said that you connect with everyone around you or with the universe. So noticing just if you can, that momentary pause after your inhale and after your exhale. And now taking one more full cycle of breath, making the inhale as long, as steady, as smooth as possible and making the exhale equally as smooth and elongated, eventually the exhale will naturally reach towards a length twice as long as your inhale. Feeling, if you can, the spreading and the releasing of focus um, from the space right between your eyebrows, noticing that your focus might draw kind of back more into the skull. You might feel your awareness around your body. You might even have a greater sense of your surroundings. And then since our talk today is on music, firstly, um, what we're going to do is actually chant together. Um, your first initiatory chant, if you have never chanted before, of Om, also called Om Kar chanting when the Om is repeated. So the sound is like A-U-M, giving one third equal parts to each of those um, sounds, A-U-M. And I'll demonstrate for you here, taking a deep inhale, and knowing that it doesn't matter how you sound or what the length of your ohm is. We're just going to practice together and try to just kind of let loose and be relaxed and let the sound just come out of your body. Um, let, letting these syllables kind of resonate a little bit more loudly if you can, just to have the experience of feeling that vibration of sound around you. So taking a deep inhale into the base of your belly, filling yourself completely, fully with breath. And then when you're ready on your exhale, we'll begin together. Since we tend to get a little bit louder as we do this, we're going to do three, which is um, traditionally, as you're initiated into the Omkar chant, what you would do. So we're going to take a deep inhale together, filling the base of the belly and then all the way up into the chest, into the neck with breath. And beginning when you're ready. going to do the last one together, really just allowing the sound and the vibration to fill your body and to, to spread outwards from your own physical body. Taking a deep inhale together. returning to normal breathing, but keeping your eyes closed for just one second longer as you feel that continuous amount uh, of pressure between your first finger and your thumb, the same amount of pressure. So you feel those two points coming together. 
the reason that we practice mudras or some of these hand gestures is to cycle our own energy internally, but yet oddly we feel more connected to everyone around us and to the world when we come out of these types of meditation. Taking that last deep breath into your belly and allowing yourself to completely release slowly on your exhale, letting all of the air in your body go as you push out the last bit of breath from the base of your abdomen, feeling completely relaxed, letting go of any tension, any tightness in the body. And that vibration and sound usually helps us to release and break up any blockages in that flow of prana or chi as well. And on your next inhale, when you're ready, I guess we'll glide our hands into heart center and bow your chin towards your heart. And you can repeat um, the word namaste after me if you so choose. Thank you and namaste. Good. And gently opening your eyes. Thank you all so much for participating. I really appreciate it. That was so nice of you. <laughs> so... Um, how does everyone feel? Do we have any just words that we want to toss out? Nap time. Nap time. Okay. Well, I was hoping we would do something somewhat active, but yes, very calming. So maybe you would induce nap time. Yes? Yes, absolutely. That is the um, focus of meditation, I would say, and also of yoga nidra. Um, you always do a short relaxation or shavasana at the end of every yoga practice, but there's also longer relaxation practices while you're um, kind of rotating your consciousness from one item. And then as you move your focus towards more of a one-pointed focus on the path of yoga, as you move towards um, <laughs> uh, dharana, that single-pointed focus, sometimes gazing at a flame, sometimes repeating a mantra, then you can move into dhyana, which is more of a free meditation where you are more released, um, absolutely, in your mind. So it looks like we are out of time. <laughs> oh, sorry, what? I think that there is a similarity, though, because with some of the chants and the mantras, there, um, if you really look at uh, what they're saying and the significance, the translation, they really do seem very similar to a lot of prayers, I would say. So um, I, I think the practice of praying, you're moving your focus away from yourself and um, towards other people, which is really what uh, you're saying in most of the chants and mantras. So in that way, I think that there is some similarity. Looks like we've actually already segued into a question and answer session, but let's just keep that up. So if you have uh, questions, and you can ask questions of each other as well, and have a dialogue. So uh, who would like to ask questions? And just go ahead and speak up. Back to the music learning thing. Is that why it's so so difficult to get those annoying uh, commercials out of your mind and out of the kids' minds? Yes, they're called earworms. <laughs> Uh, literally, because it's like you have a worm going into your ear. So his question was, is that, what, when I was talking about how music affects the brain, is that why it's hard to get commercial jingles out of your head? Yes. And that's why advertisers, I would say, in some ways are actually more intelligent than a lot of our pedagogues, because they're using music to get you to buy stuff. So I remember that Irish Spring song um, for Irish Spring soap from like 20 years ago. But... Teachers aren't using music in the classroom, so they should maybe study advertising and then go into teaching, and then they'll figure out how to get stuff to stick in your head. Yes? Sorry. I just wanted to ask, um, isn't it true that, um, that because of music, you, you know, like, um, like, you know, when you have uh, emotions tied to a language, you actually remember words or something like that? Is that true? That it's easier to remember them when you tie them to emotions? And that's why music is very very effective? Exactly, exactly. So if you hate chemistry and you have a song that teaches you the periodic table and it's to a song that you like, I'm just using Lady Gaga as an example, you're more likely to feel more 
positive when you go into your chemistry classroom and you have to take a test. So that's one of the reasons that music is, is so powerful because it's not only affecting the parts of your brain that are processing the sounds of the music and the lyrics, but you're activating your heart and your soul. And you know that might not interest you when you're learning chemistry, for example, but when you're learning a language and a song really speaks to you, whether it's about loss, love, whatever, you, it's, it's like sometimes music can just overtake you, right? Where you're not even thinking about the lyrics, actually. You're just almost like in a trance mode with the, with the music. And it's right, you're right, it's about the emotions. Almost a trance or a meditative state. And I guess if we were really good teachers, we would probably incorporate um, smell as well and use all of them together for one very um, profound and strong kind of learning technique. Because I think that... Um, Oh, there's different studies, but I think that smell is actually equally as strong. And definitely when tied to emotions, uh, that becomes kind of the strength behind it. Um, yes, up here. I noticed, oh. I noticed that your voice got deeper when you did the OM than when you sang those two songs. Mm -hmm. What exactly is a mantra? How would you define it? Um, a mantra is um, a word that can have, uh, again, it can be like a concept or an idea that you repeat. And at first you might be focused on the um, sort of the translation or the meaning or the significance of the mantra when you begin to chant it. But you are supposed to repeat that sound and move more into the sound, the vibration, kind of the resonance of the mantra so that you do more, move into more of that trance or meditative state so that you begin to kind of release your um, attachments in your mind, if you will, moving into kind of a broader and um, typically a higher mindset, a higher frequency for your mind to function on. Yes. And I'm actually doing a six month long teacher training right now and we were just focusing on the ancient types of yoga and there are only um, five, maybe six, depending um, on the last and how you see it, if it's a part of one or if it's separate, um, types of yoga that have been around for about 5,000 years and some would say that yoga is actually dates to uh, pre-Vedic times. So that would mean it's even older than 5,000 years. Um, and some of the oldest forms of yoga are swara yoga, the yoga of sound, and japa yoga, which is more the yoga of mantra or repetition of sound. Um, and so they affect your brain slightly differently, I would say. But uh, both have been around for 5,000 years, so that should give us a reason to look into it, I think. Give it a try. <laughs> Um, I do. I don't know. I mean, I guess the um, kind of the burning of uh, of sage and certain certain smells would be a part of the yoga experience, especially when you're having like a, a bhajan or a puja, or usually that involves chanting as a group. Um, oftentimes, there's a fire, the burning of fire, and different things can be burned. Oftentimes. Um, there's uh, sometimes like a, a milk or like a ghee. There's usually a ghee, a clarified butter that's that's involved in that process. Um, so there's a smell that comes from that as well. So I definitely use more essential oils. That's slightly new age. I don't know. Some, some of these smells go back, but a lot of them are new. But I do think that it absolutely helps uh, move students into a relaxing state of mind because when you smell lavender, obviously you start to relax. You usually have a positive experience with that. I don't know anyone that has a negative experience with lavender. I guess it could work the other way, but. <laughs> and yes, in that case, yeah, you would be telling me before class, don't spray me with that lavender. <laughs> oh, uh, my name is Idaho. I wanted to thank you for what you're doing because it's my area of expertise. It's cross-cultural. It's nice to meet other travelers. But let me, let me add some things that you can utilize from from my experiences as well, if you'd like. One of them, I, I was once labeled, uh, called a bard, you know, relating to music and song, because I'm a traveler through Europe. They tended to refer to me as so-and-so bard. In South America, an echo, okay? He's the person who goes around from village to village, speaks badly, maybe, many languages, 
And here, my name is Kopopeli, okay, given to me by the Okeawinka tribe and others here. And so those elements of what you know of them is what is a personality. It's a personality type. Sometimes I have apprentice training. People who want to learn how to interact, go to new places, not be afraid, like you're, you were talking about. Go learn another language. Be willing to speak. You might find me mumbling behind you, just copying what you say anywhere in the world, because it's you know, my way to learn. Not be afraid to speak. But it's a temperament, too. It's a personality type. So it's the introverts that often seek me out. Please give me your gift or you know, help me. And I said, well, you did just by making contact with me. Because you know, if you go to another introvert, you may not get very far sometimes. I'm not putting introverts down in any way. It's just I am what I am. And sometimes we are what we are of our personality. I'm not afraid. I will you know, go experience and go and travel and see the world. We have one planet, one spaceship, Earth. Say to any young people, let's go out there and make the best of it. And I'm glad to have met you two today. Thank you. Now, I was going to help them add some terms they might want to utilize and integrate into your things. Because I'm a dance, do over 30 instruments I've played, been a rostered artist in education, National Endowment's doing all those kinds of things. So we just do what we do. So keep it up. Thank you. Well, I'd like to make a comment about that because I'm actually an introvert. and. People find that to be quite surprising because, I mean, you know, here I am giving a presentation and I put videos on YouTube. And I actually think that there are certain qualities that introverts have that really help with, with processing language and listening to music. Because introverts, for being introverts, need to have time alone to process things and probably naturally will listen a lot more before they open their mouths, whether that's speaking in their own language to express themselves or when it comes to learning. And that's really important when it comes to learning language because, as I mentioned in my presentation, people want to start speaking from day one or teachers force students to start speaking from day one. But that's not, that, that's not so natural for, for a lot of people. So there are, uh, I've met other polyglots who are also introverts. So. You don't have to be extroverted to learn languages. Believe me, you can still be shy and learn languages. It, it works. Yeah. Thank you. I want to ask another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. Like, um, well, I remember uh, how you said also like learning um, learning a language. You know that you know like uh, listening to songs help you learn languages. Uh, but. Um, I'm thinking that that would probably be like best for like languages that are closer to your mother tongue or to your native language, right? Uh, because for languages that are like further away, and um, would it be like more of a challenge, right? Because I I'm thinking you have to like actually know some of the some of the vocabulary, because uh, otherwise it would be like a string of sounds or something, right? Um, but but yeah, like uh, I want to ask Dasha um, also, like. Um, like, you know, like learning um, uh, the African languages or the Indian languages, uh, was it uh, very hard to learn also uh, through music? Um, the music definitely helped uh, yeah. me to remember. And I would definitely say that I'm, um, I've am i studied or um, uh, taken classes and learned these languages. I definitely wouldn't say that I'm fluent in all of them. I would love to be, or even just, um, you know, at a speaking level. But when I was there, I, I feel like... Um, I was able to acquire them uh, more so when I was involved with song and dance and also when I was teaching English um, to children or and, and in all these countries I did um, some service work um, sometimes with multiple NGOs and so that would require of me more more use of the language and that surely helped so that's somewhat of an extroverted quality I guess just getting out there and speaking but the listening is equally as important <laughs> definitely um, and uh, so yes I think the um, the song, the dance, all of those things helped quite a bit. And then there's something that happens when you learn different languages. Sometimes they have the same roots, sometimes they don't. Um, and definitely the structure is different, uh, you know, where you put um, the different parts of, of the sentence in place uh, when speaking. But um, 
definitely the uh, the listening and the ear for accents and tones. If you start to learn tonal languages, does definitely it, it's it's kind of like an acquired taste. You definitely grow and become uh, more nuanced in your understanding and your listening. And so I think the more languages that I study, the easier it does get. For sure, and to answer your question about languages which are further from your mother tongue and how music plays a role. So earlier when we were eating breakfast, I was speaking to the Saudi Arabian student who was out there helping out. And he asked me, oh, so did you study Arabic? And I said, yeah, I studied Arabic about 11 years ago. And I gave up because my Arabic pronunciation CD, it broke my CD player. And what happened was, so if you've ever heard Arabic, you know, they have a lot of, a lot of guttural sounds, the, huh and the ones that I can't pronounce. So with my CD, there was a section where I was learning those guttural sounds, and I kept on pressing rewind, 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 and I ended up breaking my CD player because I kept on going like this, and I, I was so <laughs> frustrated. This was before I realized the link between language and music. And I had been listening, actually, you know, on my own to Arabic music, uh, but not that much at that time. And what I realized was that if my instructor had given us a song or several songs to listen to in Arabic, just so that we could hear those sounds and reproduce them, I would have had so much more fun and I would not have been as annoyed if I had broken my CD player because at least it was something enjoyable. But when it was just I, I was really annoyed. So you need to learn those, you need, if the, the, the further the language is from your mother the tongue, even more important the music is. Because it's engaging you in an emotional level, but it's also helping you learn those sounds. So later on, when you're actually speaking or learning the grammar, things are going to click in your mind. Yeah. And just to add on to that, it seems like language is so contextual. Like definitely the experience, the people, the emotions that you're feeling, even the smells and the different restaurants or where you go, kind of help to form um, that that learning bridge in your mind between all of these different things. So. With language being so contextual, I can see now how uh, definitely the grammar books and the repetition, the repetition out of context really doesn't make so much sense in terms of learning language. And I actually got some of my worst grades in all of my language classes. I was really bad, but then um, when I went out and it was more of a social setting or interacting with people, maybe just one-on-one -on -one or helping people, that was where um, I was able to learn a lot more language. And then I would leave these countries usually being able to speak um, usually above average or, or better than most of the people that were studying the language, just because I was getting out there and using it and putting it into context and making it rich and um, forming these social connections around it. I won't project, I'll just uh, use technology. So I understand being in a culture immersing yourself or being able to listen to music or the pronunciation repeatedly uh, is the best case scenario. But whereas we are in America, not all of us uh, are ambitious enough to study abroad quite as much or, or whatever the case may be. Um, do you have any tips or tricks or what have helped you guys in, you gals, in kind of overcoming the um, the reluctance to kind of put your foot in your mouth and like you said approach an Arabic student and use the little that you have when it isn't robust and impressive and you're not quite eloquent um, yeah what kind of tips and tricks do you have as far as overcoming that step to uh, facilitate learning you have videos on this so yeah I do <laughs> I I would say that's where music comes in you know if there's like a cultural event or a choir or something like that where you could be singing those songs that that you know that helps you overcome it or if there's a festival or an event like for example the Japanese they always have their Sakura festival right the I forgot the word in English actually what's that flower that they the cherry, cherry blossom. blossom right so let's say you're going to some cherry blossom festival you know you're gonna practice it there or you do a language exchange where you're helping somebody who wants to learn English and their English may be just at the same level as your Arabic or Japanese or Spanish or whatever. So you're both making fools of yourselves in front of each other. So it's kind of an equal opportunity way to, to, to kind of let down your guard. Um, and, you know, let's say you want to learn Portuguese. Maybe you can learn, uh, you can join a capoeira group that does the Brazilian martial arts. And so you're moving your body. 
and you're hearing Portuguese and you have to repeat the Portuguese at the same time, or jujitsu, something, something where you're, you're incorporating your body, or a cooking show. Let's say you really want to learn Thai cooking. Well, you go on the internet and you find Thai cooking lessons. Maybe you don't have people here who can teach you, but you can find internet videos. So you find something that you're interested in, or going back to sports. Let's say you're a rugby fan, right? Okay, well, that's not, that doesn't work because that's the mostly English speaking. Let's say it's cricket and you want to learn Hindi. Well, you start following cricket commentary in Hindi or whatever it is. So you find something that you like and you tie it to the language. And I tend to um, follow some of like the social causes uh, from some of these other countries. So just like Facebook groups and different things like that, they'll put up lots of videos. So that helps to keep somewhat of a tie. Um, and then in terms of like letting your guard down, I would say um, definitely connecting with someone who's uh, English is at the same level or even less maybe than your level because then, yeah. And also I've, um, I think you know, the times when I did learn the language the best, now that I look on, um, you know, all these times living abroad, it was when I was working with children because I had no guard. And, you know, they were, um, you know, very much in that learning phase, like a sponge. They were just soaking up everything. They were happy to repeat it and ask questions, and it didn't matter. And so uh, working with kids definitely improved my language. <laughs> You know, I can understand because music also is kind of a protective factor. I wanted to know if you would like to add anything regarding that or if you have any other information. Yeah, I do speak about that sometimes in my presentation. My presentations, what happens is is when somebody is multi actively multilingual, this just doesn't mean that, you know, you studied French 30 years ago and you can, whatever, understand a few things. It's actively multilingual. Your brain, the, dis the executive functions of the brain are constantly working because you're trying to figure out, do I use this word, do I use that word? And, you know, it happens that some of us are multilingual, we, we mix up words, and I still do that. Because even though English is my strongest language, Russian is my first language. And sometimes it's kind of embarrassing, but I'll be speaking in English and I suddenly can't think of a word in English and it comes to me in Russian. And what happens when your brain is more active because the executive functions of your brain are trying to decide, do I follow the syntax of Russian or do I follow the syntax of English? Your brain is more active, so you're more like, you're, you're, uh, you can delay Alzheimer's. Now, it doesn't prevent it but it delays it just because you're active. That's why crossword puzzles are recommended for seniors who aren't studying or doing anything active, learning anything new. And I actually did a presentation once at Stanford Hospital to a group of seniors about learning languages because they were doing a, uh, a research study about um, what can help seniors prevent lang um, Alzheimer's and le language learning was one of them. And the funny thing was that the day before, I, I was going, going to do a presentation on Spanish TV, and I left my nice clothes by the door because I, you know, I left really early and I came, I went in jeans, and I ended up 